Hello and welcome to the IPC once again. We are glad to see uh, some journalists with us here in the room today and also we have an audience online. So welcome to you too. Uh, we are now getting into uh, the, the period in Denmark where we are going to be very close to the election. So uh, once again we try to host a couple of events here at the IPC and um, today I'm really glad to introduce an uh, old friend of the house, Kasper Müller Hansen from the University of Copenhagen. Kasper has been here many times before, and I think it's safe to say that uh, that he's one of the most used and probably also one of the most knowledgeable, in our opinion, uh, election experts in Denmark. So uh, I think it's always worthwhile to get a, an update from Kasper a couple of weeks before the election. And I know also afterwards, of course, if there are any follow-ups or anything, Kaspar is normally very helpful to help both the Danish and the international press. So I'm sure there's going to be plenty of opportunity in the weeks to come to, to also consult Kaspar if time will allow. I know you're really busy. Um, we'll start here with a presentation uh, by Kaspar, and then afterwards we will go to a Q&A session where we'll try to accommodate both questions here from the room and also from uh, the journalists who are with us online this morning. So I think without further ado, I'll leave the floor to you, Kasper. Thank you. Once again, welcome. Please. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here, uh, to have a chance to talk a little bit about what I'm doing and, and try to uh, understand elections uh, with you guys. Um, we, I'm chairing the, what we call the Danish National Election Studies. So in every country around the world almost, there's a, an election study. And what we do is that we have this really large base for, for asking Danes about anything about politics just after the election. So at the moment I'm planning the next election study to field, uh, we will ask almost 30,000 Danes just after the election. So I will tell you a little about what we have known, we know so far about the election and also based on actually 19 elections where we've done this, asking Danes about wh why they vote and why they, they don't and, and who they vote for. So, so we actually are quite good at understanding Danish election because we have so much material. And after each election, we write a book. These are the, the, the last three elections. The, the newest one is the climate election it's from 2019, uh, where, of course, the focus was on the climate change and the whole discussion. Um, in 2015, we focused on some of the the discussion around uh, center and, and peripheral uh, because there was a really heated discussion. That discussion actually coming back, I'll tell you a bit more about that. This was the, the crisis election where there was a financial crisis and we had an election in the middle of it. And we just finished this, uh, this larger book, which is in English, uh, called The Danish Voter. And it's actually tried to recap the whole story about the Danish electoral the last 50 years and um, how it is actually possible to navigate in this uh, uh, quite confusing uh, election with so many parties. I'm sure if you come, if you visiting Denmark for the first time doing an election, 14 parties is a, is a lot, uh, and it's also a lot for us as election researchers. But apparently, the, the voters actually know what they're doing. So I'll tell you a little bit about how how that actually could can be. We also wrote a book about the Nordic voter, which came out a, a few years ago, where we compared Denmark to the rest of the Nordic countries and tried to to understand uh, how election works in Denmark compared to the other Nordic countries. Um, feel free to, to jump in with questions if possible along the way. Uh, just to kind of to recap some of the, why this election is special. Um, first of all, there's 14 running parties. We have had that before. We also have more, but it's back in the 80s. So we have three new ones, uh, two which probably will come into parliament. We have to go back all the way to 73, where we have this, what we call the earthquake election in Denmark, where, where more parties actually came into parliament. But, but if two new parties come in, that is actually, you have to go 50 years back before we've seen this. Um, we have seen more politicians changing parties in this period. I mean, politicians have basically left their old party and many of them got members of new ones and, and are running now for new uh, different parties. We have at least three potential candidates as prime minister. I would actually see, say there is a fourth, the, the former prime minister, Lars Lukke. 
He's actually also in the game. Uh, he hasn't called it yet, but uh, looking at the polls, he's definitely in there. Uh, we have more voters than ever before changing parties. It's close to 50% now. So 50% of the Danes have changed a party already. And the election is still in two weeks time, right? So, so almost half of the Danes have, have basically already switched around. There is so many new combinations of issues and agendas in this election. Uh, try to make it a little bit less confusing, but even for us, which have followed this, seems to be, it's, it's very difficult to say that this is the agenda of this election. So, so what our book is going to be called, last time it was quite easy, the climate election. It's not going to be climate election this time, but what it's, I mean, I actually thought that Corona would have played a bigger role. It doesn't seem really to have caught on yet. Um, there's other issues of inflation and energy, which actually team to more or less have swept the, the voters away and they're just focusing quite a lot on that at the moment. But let me try to just, to, for, for them, some of you that don't know the Danish political system, so we have a, a multi-party system. We have 10 parties in parliament at the moment. We have 14 running, so we have four new ones. We have a proportional representative system. That means that one, if 10% if of the votes go to one party, they actually get 10% of the vote in parliament. It's a very proportional system. It's actually one of the most proportional systems in the world. We have a very low threshold, only 2%. Remember Sweden, 4, Germany, 5. So we actually allow quite a lot of uh, parties to get in. There has been this change in the Danish electoral uh, a few years back where they now it's made it digital how to collect signatures in, in order to be able to run. So previously it was very kind of demanding. You had to sign a, a, a physical piece of paper that has to be delivered to the municipality. The municipality sent it back to you. You had to send it back to the party. The party had to give it to the ministry. That's all changed now. Now it's just a digital signature. That means that it's so much easier to collect 20,000 signatures today than it was just 10 years ago. And that's why we have all these parties at the moment. It's so easy. One time on TV and you got the 20,000 signatures. They're gonna, that's going to be a discussion after the election. They're probably going to change the level, so not going to be 20,000, maybe 80,000 or something, because it's 14 party running is a, it's a bit high, and it creates some instabilities, I guess, in, in the political system. We have extremely high turnout. 85% has been falling the last two elections, but from 86 to 85, it's like in that ball game. So might see a little bit of a decline again. It's not going to drop below 80%, but it could be 83, and 83 will be a big discussion in Denmark if that happens, because that will be the lowest we have seen for a very, very long time. At the moment, we have a single party minority government. There's just one party in government, uh, Mette Frederiksen, Social Democrats. She's able to go left if you want to do climate things. She can go right if you want to do strict immigration laws. So she can kind of play back and forth. That usually, so it's not a fixed coalition as we usually see in most other countries. Uh, she actually played that game quite well. Uh, during Corona, she's been, uh, she's been a very strong leader. She's been, been able to kind of put forth, we're going to do this, and then she's gonna, she, she actually formed that majority whether she had to go left or right. We're having an election now because one party, the Social Liberal, has forced the Prime Minister to call this election. Um, they were disappointed how she reacted to this commission report about the minx. The minx was these small animals Danes keep in small spaces where they, they kill them for first and sell them to uh, most of Europe or and Eastern and Asia. Um, so what happened was, if you don't know the story, was basically that, that was a, the virus, the coronavirus was spreading among the minks. And at a very, very short period of time, they had to decide whether they had to kill all these animals or could they do something else. And they decided to kill them. Apparently, there wasn't a, actually, there was no law that could, that could um, there was no legislation that actually could uh, kind of build up around that uh, position. So it was actually illegal to call for this killing of these animals. Afterwards, that was kind of, the, the, the parliament decided that it was legal. Uh, so they, they made a new law and said it was legal, but in those days it was illegal. And that, of course, I mean, a government has to follow the law. Um, a minister was fired. Uh, some uh, deputy uh, civil servants was 
put on hold, etc. But really, it hasn't been placed a very firm responsibility. And the opposition at the moment are trying to place that responsibility with the prime minister. Uh, she's saying that this is all over. Uh, she said that we couldn't have done anything else. It was a mistake. She would have liked to make it, made it different. But basically, she hasn't said sorry. And that, that was basically what have called this election. If she had gone out and said, I'm sorry, this was a mistake, we wouldn't have had this election we are having now. Um, on the other hand, the way she, it was called was quite a strange thing. So it was actually before so the summer in, in early June, July, in early July, where the, the social liberals were saying, OK, guys, you need to call an election before um, 4th of October. So they had this three months period where they could play around and do politics. So what the Social Democrats did was they've been extremely effective in actually implementing a lot of legislation on everything else that has nothing to do with minks, but on rent for, for houses and just an example for providing money to people that, that have um, high uh, energy bills. So they've done a lot, a lot of things in these three months period and kind of pushed the agenda away from this discussion about the minks to everything else. And they've been very, very effective in doing that. And at the moment, it doesn't really seem to play a big role, this mink. I mean, the, it's actually the cause of the election, but it doesn't seem to play a big role in the, the discussions anymore. The oppositions are, of course, pointing to the prime minister every time they have a chance, saying, well, well, you, you were too powerful. You were kind of always only focused on your small team of the government, not trying to involve the whole parliament, etc. So they're trying again and again. But it seems very much like the voters has already chosen either you on this side or you on that side. It doesn't seem to move people. And, and so at the moment, the opposition, which are a little bit in the league at the moment, if you include Lars Lugget, the former prime minister and his new party, um, they, they, they're trying to do everything else. I mean, they have to kind of move the, uh, the public in their direction. But at the moment, it's so close that we have no chance of telling who's going to win. And I'll get back to that. Yeah, so, so the Prime Minister can call it every time, like, any time she wants, and that's what she was forced to. Um, okay, Let, let's try to just try to understand the Danish political system again. So we have usually, as we, we have in most countries, we have a left-right when it comes to economy. So over here you have parties saying that the state should do more. Here you have the state should do less, more individual based. But this other dimension is very important in Denmark. And this is more like a value dimension. We, we see it emerging in most other countries at the moment as well. So up here you have strict uh, uh, <coughs> policies to refugees. You have anti-climate discussions. Down here you have pro-climate discussion and you are very more, much more open. You're tough on crime. You're more kind of uh, the opposite down here. So, so this kind of picture, have to remember there's always two dimensions at least in Danish politics because otherwise we wouldn't understand why people why these coalitions are being built so every election we ask all the voters as I told you before and and so this is where the voters place themselves so so this dot here will be the social democrats in 2019 um, this is where the voters they're not it's not me placing them it's the voters themselves so here you have the social democrats and here, I, I kind of just to make it more simple, this is just, so if you are up here, you, you agree that immigration is a cultural threat. So this will be the, the, the right wing um, uh, position on values. This will be the left wing down here. So here you will say, if you are down this area of the graph, you will say that you should include refugees much more and you should have more immigrants and you should have better integration. Up here, you will see, have stricter regulation to to throw them out as quickly as possible. Up here you have the Danish People's Party. Down here you have the Unity List uh, and the Alternatives, two small parties down here. Uh, the SF is the Socialist Pe People's Party. Over here you have the two, uh, the Conservatives and the Liberal, very close together. The Conservatives a little bit more to the right when it comes to the com economy. Uh, the Liberals are, are more to the centre. And, and these are the old parties, right? But as I told you, there's actually there's a lot of new parties. Lars Lukke, the former prime minister, is placing himself right there. And he's trying to say, I'm not red. Red parties down here, blue parties up here. Uh, he's uh, purple. 
That's uh, his color. He's trying to argue that he, he will not be placed left and right. Um, so he's like trying to play the game that he could either support a government up among these parties or these parties. Whether it's going to succeed, we'll see uh, within a few weeks, right? Another party actually also coming out of the Liberals. So this is, this is actually, so the Liberals are placed here, right? Their, their prime minister candidate now is uh, Jakob Ellemann Jensen. And their former leader, Lars Lykke, is here. Their former vice uh, deputy leader, Inger Stoiberg, is right here. So now you have a party of the Liberal which have broken out in two. Inger Stoiberg up there, there, very close to the Danish People's Party. And Lars Lykke down here. Uh, Inger Stoiberg uh, announced her candidacy basically without saying much, except that you know where you have me. Uh, the story behind her is that she's former Minister of Integration and has played this tough on immigrants for a long time. She was actually having an impeachment case against her and she was in, in prison for three months uh, uh, because of that. And it's, yeah, um, uh, yeah, but now she's running her own party. So even though she, she, she served her sentence, she is, uh, was declared unfit to sit, to sit in parliament, was thrown out because of this. So she's not in parliament at the moment, but she's running again. And because she's running with 10% now in the polls, she will be crucial. So all these guys around here is trying to be very nice to her, saying that, well, of course, well, you have served your sentence now. You are, you are all welcome. So she basically what happened is that she's taking almost all of the votes for the Danish People's Party. At the moment, Danish People's Party is very close to getting under the threshold. Um, some of the polls are actually shown she's under the threshold. Um, so they, at the moment, the Danish People's Party will go from, just in 2015, they were about over 20%, now they are 2%. And that's just two elections. So they have tr lost tremendously to Inger Støjberg. Um, they also lost to, the, to, not to these parties, but not to this one, but these two. This is the new right, which was a new party which was started in 2016. So a lot of votes went from the Danish People's Party to the new right, and even more votes went to the Danish Democrats. Over here we have a, a small party called the Liberal Alliance, which is very right on economy. They talk about like lower taxes, lower taxes, that's their main issue. Um, so they've been taking votes from the, the conservatives. The Christian Democrats are very small. They not seem to be getting into parliament. Um, down here on the other end, we have the alternative, which is at the moment member of the parliament. They will probably now get in with maybe four mandates, at, if we look at the poll. Another very green party down here, uh, almost kind of activist uh, party, uh, doesn't seem to get in. So we, these have been competing for the green votes down here. Um, and it's a, it's a, the, the, the party space, as you can see, is a bit crowded down here. So it's like, it's, it's difficult for, if, it, it could end up that many of these was under 2%, but at that moment it actually seems like the alternative will get in and these will not get in, which is called the free, uh, the, the, free, the free Green Party. So you can see when we try to place this, um, I think the point is that these up here will be considered as blue parties. Lars Lykke is, will not, declare himself as blue, but I would be happy to do it. He's former vice, former leader of the Liberals, of course he is blue. So, um, and he said so many things about supporting the other side that it's almost seemed impossible. But he's playing the game. He's trying to sell himself as expensive as possible to these guys by saying that he will be willing to, to work with the other camp, which will be the, the, the red camp. So whoever in these two camps will get the most votes, will get the prime minister. At the moment, the poll which came out yesterday, it's 50-50. And it's like, who's going to win? At the moment, so the Social Democrats do have some momentum. They have been gaining in the polls. Um, Lars Lykke has uh, been gaining in the polls. He's actually doubled his, uh, uh, from three to 6% in the first week of the, the, um, the campaign. But what has happened is that basically, um, votes from the social liberals down here has been moved up here to Lars Lykke. And at the same time, Mette Frederiksen is winning a little bit back from the, the Danish Democrats. So that means that we again seeing 50-50 when it comes to these two, uh, uh, red, the red or the blue. I have a question. Please, yes. Um, um, 
when comparing with other countries, for instance, Finland and maybe Finland and Sweden and Norway as well, it seems that the um, the movements in Denmark from one party to another, they are a lot bigger than in other Nordic countries. Yes. What, what would you say is mm. it, if If we take Sweden, for instance, um, the what we call class, like where, where you, what kind of work you have, what kind of education you have, is still much stronger in Sweden than we see in Denmark. In Denmark, the class voting has simply declined and declined and declined. It's also declining in Sweden, but it hasn't gotten anywhere near as is in Denmark. Finland is also quite low on class voting. Um, the reason, I think, is, I think, there's a lot of different reasons, but, but first of all, I think, the politics, the parties has changed position. I mean, the Social Democrats, I don't have the slides with me now, but if, if I had measured the Social Democrats over the years, I do that, if, so every election I measure them, they will be moving something like, like this. Yeah. So, so they have moved and they have lost votes, voters which have stayed the same, have actually had to find a new home with these parties, for instance. So in Denmark, the parties are definitely moving. And, and that is one thing. It's not because the voters are moving necessarily, it's because the parties have moved. Um, then I think what, what is also important is that if you try to understand like, the characteristic of people changing party, that, I mean, young people change more, sure, but the, by far most important is that they have changed before. And somehow there's kind of a reinforcing effect. So if... Not anymore. I mean, now it's just in, almost to seem the common thing to do. Well, I said it was 50%, so it's close to 50%. There's still more voting the same, at least, but it's getting up there. It's not something which have, it's, it has steadily increased at, at every election for the last 15 years or so, but it just seems to be the new record will be these, I think it's 70, 47% at the moment, if I kind of calculate it correctly. Uh, have changed party, if I take all the polls and say this will be the election result, yes. 47 percent. Uh, at the earthquake election, which is, was the previous record, it was 44 percent as a comparison. Um, but but, but I don't, even most of these movements are happening within each block, right? So, so much of it is like moving from uh, the liberals over to this, the Danish uh, Democrats or from the Danish People's Party to, so much of it is within each block. It's only about seven percentage point that goes this way. The point is that at the moment, five percent has moved this way and only two percent have moved this way. And that's why it's 50-50 at the moment, because just after the election in 2019, it was the strongest red majority since 71, right? So in, in this period, the red had actually um, lost tremendously on uh, uh, of votes to the other side. Um, and it's usually it goes like 3% one way and 3% the other way, but this one is just 5-2, and that means that, that it uh, has equalized the, the size of the two blocks. Since change 5-2, the 5-2 blue block and 2 That's now. That's just now? Yeah. Compared to last year? Um, yes. So within those 47%, seven of those is moving across the middle. Yes. Yeah, please. Question. Yes, yeah. What is the wealth of state in the tree? Do you think it Good, good point. Yeah, well. I am not common transmissions on the same as the question. Oh, no, that, 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 that is true. Yeah, um, all of them want social welfare. That, that's basically the point. So, so the universal welfare state in Denmark is so strong and most, most of all, all these parties, so serious discussion about cutting the welfare state is like not happening. Even the Liberal Party, which is probably where you find this the most, so, so you will probably put the divide somewhere here. These two parties, the new right and the Liberal, they will say openly that they're willing to cut the welfare state. All these will just a matter of size. But they will all want bigger but they want it in different ways, maybe. Um, this is, I just took one question out. We could have taken other questions, but it, it will show the same picture that you see this divide, that the further you get, oops, the further you get to the left, the stronger they want the welfare state. So the further you get over here, the stronger you want the welfare state compared to going in this direction. But it's, it's we, we, so we, but in the campaign, a basic not discussion 
So, so the way the liberals, for instance, will discuss the welfare state in terms of, they will say we should have more free choice, basically meaning that you should also have a private company to su supply whatever, and then you should have a free choice between them. But they're not really talking about cutting the welfare state. It's very, very difficult for them to, to say that openly. If, yeah? I'm not sure your message is correct. Okay. Talk about the violence and people. Yes, yeah. Happening now. Mm -hmm. And just go back to say, how much is it changing? When you see what the terms are kind of more for the reality. So, how do you have to do this? Yeah. How do you have to say things for that? How do you have to say what you have to do? So, so let's say uh, the voters, a voter was. The Social Democrat was in 2019 were placed here. At the moment, after this election, I will, they will probably be placed here. And in the election before that, they were placed here. So that voter, if you answer those two questions, you might want to place yourself here and you voted for the Social Democrats. But now the Social, the Social Democrat has moved away. So now you will look, okay, now these parties are closer to you. So, so, so basically what is happening is that the voters seem to be on the attitude are quite stable, but when it comes to their party choice, they have to move or they have to change their attitude, right? And it seems like they would rather keep their ideology or their position here than, than moving uh, with their party, their previous party. Yeah, but the point is that this is not necessarily class anymore. That could be something else. It could be basically, of course, there's still a little bit of class in it, but it's, but it's very much uh, other things than class. Uh, where you live, for instance, uh, what kind of education you have, uh, etc. Okay. So this is the. This came out yesterday. This is the three prime ministers' candidates. So there's the for the present prime minister Mette Frederiksen. Um, and here we see her approval rating. So this is basically how many percent of the electorate at the moment think that she will be, do uh, the best job as prime minister. For a long time, this is starting in, in four, oh sorry, this is in April, uh, and no, no. This is uh, uh, in September and then it goes to, yeah, the 12th, that's the day before yesterday, right? And what basically there's a long period where it was basically 50-50. And my point is basically that this was in a period where, where the mink was being discussed, but the, the voters was very, very quick to kind of position themselves. So the one supporting here would say, okay, this might not be good, but the other side is not better. So I would still prefer Mette Frederiksen. And, and what we saw was this extreme polarization when it came to the, the, whether you support one side or the other. The others had for a long time a, a huge lead to Søren Pave from the Conservative. So he has for a long, long time was like, by far the most prominent candidate. But in, then the election was called and there came out a few um, bad cases for him. He was, uh, his husband was uh, accused of basically uh, painting a portrait of himself being more connected uh, than he was. And kind of a lot of strange, it wasn't anything he actually done, but he kind of just, uh, several times kind of put that forward that my husband did that and that and then that and was this huge hot shot but apparently he wasn't and that now he's became divorced like right here in the middle of all this uh, and then again there was a few cases where, where he just said stupid things like wasn't really uh, thinking I guess but but he was caught in seven not, not so much about his husband but also then he said something about Greenland um, and he and basically that that's just built up so this whole kind of, he was the most trustworthy candidate for a long term, just fell apart within basically two weeks or so. I think the point is why it fell apart so quickly was that Jakob Elliman, who, who came as the new leader of the Liberal after Lars Løkke uh, left the party, um, had a really, really difficult time playing that role. He used to be uh, spokesperson of the party and could say a lot of kind of funny thing, being kind of relaxed and was very, most people liked him in that role, but he, but taking the role as party leader, um, th that didn't seem to fit him. Uh, and he was for a long time, of course, also building on that, that he, he came to power in a struggle within the party. So for a long time, voters were simply believing in, in certain paper. And as you can see moment, at the moment now it actually switched around. So now uh, Illiman is higher than 
and Søren Pape. If we kind of add these two together, we will get something around 40 something percent. So we have to remember that that meta is not compared, it has to come somehow be the aggregate of these two. So it's not so so much different from MIDI, but MIDI is like the only candidate from the red side. So all the red parties before will point to MIDI, but in the blue side they will point to these two, and they might even point to another candidate that could be Lars Lykke, for instance. But it's very important to be, of course, they, first of all, they have to be able to not to have a majority against them if they want to form a government. But it's, the, the size is very diff, it, important because they have decided among them that the, that the biggest candidate of the two, the largest in the percent, after the election will be the ones who will go first in trying to form a government. So I, I think uh, Jakob Ellerman is quite happy with these results because it seems like that, that it has switched around and it switched around yeah, very quickly. Surprisingly quickly, I would also say, but, but I think, I guess, Many of these votes moved from the Liberals to the Conservatives because they weren't satisfied with him as, as chair. But, and so they were moving because they didn't like the, 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 the leader, thinking that he was the man, and then everything fell apart with him, and then basically said, well, it's not better, apparently, with the Conservative. And then they came back, and they, as you can see, they came back uh, very quickly. Um, and if this continued the last weeks, I mean, it's, it seems again that, that element. It is also very important to say, say that this period where Medi just they were pushing out all this politics actually have helped her. Um, so the more they talk about anything else than the minx, the better she do here. So she, she's doing very well on, she, she's trying, she's doing, a, I think, a good job trying to play this statement. She's trying to go out and say, well, I am the prime minister, I am your security for, for this against the, the Russian in Ukraine, the, all these, the, the gas pipes explosions, etc. So she's, she's playing on that as uh, quite high, uh, quite, um, quite close, uh, quite uh, obvious at the moment uh, as well. Foreign policy is very, very little debated. That, 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 that's a very good point, yeah. At the Danes and the parties are almost agree on everything when it comes to Ukraine. I mean, it's very difficult to see where is actually the divide among the parties. I mean, they, they want to support them all the way. I think if, if we were talking about putting Danish troops into Ukraine fighting along the Ukrainians, I think that would probably be where you would see things. But uh, that's not on the table at the moment. Um, yeah. So, uh, oh, yeah. How straightforward is this that we have three climate minister candidates in Denmark? Uh, that's... That's very seldom. But of course, in Denmark being a multi-party system means actually that all the parties have candidates for prime minister. We don't vote them directly, but it's actually the first time we have to go back to the 60s where there were three candidates as well. So it's not, but it's also, it's kind of strange thing. The reason why it ended up being three is basically because he was so high in the poll. So there were, so the, the media in Denmark basically had to say, well, if he's so high, they can't do debate between him and her. They have to include him. And now they can't kick him back out, right? Because now he is one of the three candidates. So um, in the last election, many of the smaller parties all said, I want to be prime minister. But, the, but they didn't, the media in Denmark didn't find it realistic. So they didn't invite them to all these party duels. But, but because of this over here, if, if, if this was the result at the moment, he would never have been invited in. But now he is, now he's there. So it's a, uh, yeah. It, it's, it's also been, so when they do these duels and on TV where it's the three of them, uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it do create a different kind of dynamics than if they were just red against blue. Uh, but um, yeah. This is, uh, again, um, this is from Vox, Vox Meter. I think it came out uh, just the other day, so it's quite new. And what is interesting here is that climate change is up top here. Um, Vox Meter do the thing where they ask about an open question, saying what is important for you, and then the telephone interviewer put them into categories. So it's an open question. You don't show them a list, and I think that's quite important. If you show a list with certain issues, this list looks different. So Voxmeter have the open questions, all the other polling agencies have a closed list. So they decide among these issues what is most important. 
So the way this was framed in the media yesterday was that climate change is the highest on the voters' agenda. Um, I'm quite skeptical looking at these numbers that this is actually true. Because if you take economy and taxation, if you take inflation, energy policy, private economy, these are all kind of economy elements. So if I add those together, I get much more than the 39%, right? So climate change might be easier to code for the interviewers, apparently. But I think all these has something to do with economy. So economy is definitely up here among the top. Climate change has more or less dropped out from the debate because the parties again agree. So we have a situation where Danes do care about climate change, but all the parties seem to be providing the idea that, yeah, maybe we should have, we have to, they agree to the 70% reduction in CO2 levels just after the election in 19, almost all of them. Now, some of the really red parties are pushing for an 80% reduction. Um, but it's not really a big discussion when it comes to what's on, what the voters debate themselves or when you see the parties debate because we are kind of all, all the parties are being uh, green at the moment. What makes a good uh, um, kind of agenda I issue uh, discussion is that there's a, a disagreement, that there's no disagreement. There's no disagreement, as you mentioned before, on the, on the security policies, there's no agreement on the climate change. Uh, but when it comes to some of the other issues here, we do see issues about how should we do, how, may, how should we do, especially among this is, much of this is, a, is kind of um, about how we should increase the salaries for, for nurses and, and people working in the healthcare sector. Uh, usually the politician Denmark don't interfere with that, but it's definitely an issue. The elderly is, is a, a big thing because the Social Democrat in, in, um, implemented what they called the Arne retirement plan last time. And that, that plan has been a big uh, selling point for the Social Democrats. Now, both the Liberal and Conservatives say, well, they're not so happy about this, but they accept it because there's no majority to, uh, to uh, get rid of it now. Uh, schools will always play a role in Denmark, of course. But again, you can this is, 12% is high. That is, usually it's 1%, so this is definitely higher than we have ever seen before. But it's not, a, again, it's not a good issue to, be, to, to, to discuss. Yeah. How do you... Yeah, I think it's 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 very difficult to see where is the the, the discussion. First of all, there's uh, the the Ukrainian coming to Denmark at the moment or came to Denmark at, uh, who's here now has is not considered immigrants in the way you look at people from uh, Middle East or from Africa. Um, that, that's just been a completely different discussion, which is um, interesting in itself. Um, but it's true, it's, it's not in the list anymore. It, I mean, three elections ago, that will have been number one. That, that's a good, very good point. Um, so, so um, yeah. So, so, usually, depending on how you code this, sometimes economy is top. So this, it's also, you will also ask, where is the mink here, right? Where, where's this whole discussion about Mette Frederiksen and, and whether she's a good prime minister or not? But, but usually if you say her handling of the corona situation, that would be coded up here as in the hospital sink. So this whole kind of healthcare hospital uh, is, is kind of a messy category as well, uh, where you also see there will be some uh, resentment towards uh, Mette Frederiksen or yeah. I think it's surprisingly low considering the situation, or is it? Yeah. Yeah. I think you should you should have to add them to the inflation. Yeah. To, yeah. So so actually, I think that all all these uh, orange yeah. thing. Yeah, basically, I would probably add all these four together, and that will give me much more than forty percent. So as I think it's it's pretty safe to say that that there is a lot of concern about the inflation. I mean, the, the gas bills, the electric bills, uh, the, the food prices has skyrocketed. And it's uh, definitely hurting a, a lot of people at the moment. Uh, usually you will say that this should hurt the government, right? Because you will blame the government for not have handling it. The, the point is that the Danish export the, 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 is going fantastic. The employment has never been higher in Denmark. So the, 
the opposition has more or less decided not to attack Mette Frederiksen for the economy because she will answer back. First of all, she will say, well, we somehow we got out of the corona crisis better than other countries and, and all these other key elements, we actually are very strong. Um, and it, I guess it also, it is kind of objective speaking, it, it is difficult to blame the prime minister for the inflation. I guess it's, it's basically not her fault. Usually the opposition wouldn't scare away from that, but, but uh, it seems like they haven't, they haven't really tried to hit her. It's also very difficult. So, so what is the solution to this? That would be, uh, right? The, to give more pe money to people, that's not usually a good idea um, when you want to fight inflation. So it's, it's actually also difficult because there's a huge um, kind of uh, uh, inequality discussion in this as well, uh, which, is, uh, which will push voters away towards the, the red. So I think they have basically made the calculation that they don't want to attack the, opposition, the, the, the government for this, even though you, you would do that in... Uh, we definitely saw that in 2011, where Hedy Torning were hitting Lars Lykke uh, with blaming him for the financial crisis, even though, again, it might not be was his fault that the Lehman Brothers uh, fell apart. Um, Short question. Yep. Uh, immigration. What you really say that immigration is a thing and it's so for wealth. I mean, no public wants to touch it except one. It's, it's, it's no, no. It's, it's yeah, yeah. It's it's a. I think um, when it comes to immigration, there, there's a certain number of people, about twenty percent, which think that this issue is the most important of all. I think, and that would be the ones voting for the parties. If you go, oh, sorry, if we go back again, so the parties, the Danish Democrats, the Danish People's Party, and the New Right. Those three parties at the moment have about eighteen percent. And for those, their voters, they have immigration very, very high on their agenda. Um, but it's very difficult to see what actually is the difference between these. I mean, they basically are trying, some of them, I think at the moment, they're just trying to kind of being more and more radical. So they, they, there's been some statements from, especially from the Danish People's Party, which seem to be desperate uh, just to get attention uh, on this issue. Um, the, the new right uh, is still look like they will be almost doubled in the polls compared to last time, so they'll be more than happy with that. Um, and and Inga Stoiber from the Danish Democrats are, are basically saying, you know where you have me. As she she have decided not to come up with much policy and politics on this. Um, it's basically her, her own brand, and she looked like she'll get ten percent of that. For and that's. Imp quite impressive coming from nothing, right? Not the social democrats have taken this parties. No, no, well, I have stick not, not, yeah, but they also lost them again now. So, so you're right that about two percent went this way in 2019, and now they've basically gone back to the Danish democrats. So, the reason why the social democrats are uh, where they're at, at the poll is basically because they're taking from the social liberals to here. They're not moving many votes across the middle. They're, they're still losing more than they're gaining uh, compared to the last election. But it, but it is very true that, that the issue of immigration is basically uh, being left out because the conflict is gone. You have to kind of really have to look into the detail to try to find the differences. Down here, you will, of course, have extreme views in one end. Um, but up here, these are uh, very difficult to see the difference. Uh, and, and the Social Democrats are definitely, they, I mean, they have this discussion, ongoing discussion about this uh, place in Rwanda where you're supposed to send Danish uh, uh, asylum seekers and they should be handled in Rwanda. It, it, it's basically because they promise to try to work for that. Um, I don't think many people actually believe that it's ever going to happen. But it's definitely one thing they have been so keen on to try to establish because otherwise they will be attacked from this side. So they have basically, to show Democrats has been so eager to stay in power simply by, they lost so many elections on immigration. So now they basically say, okay, we will be tough on immigration and we will keep that line. So almost whatever 
the conservatives or liberals come up with when it comes to immigration, the social democrat will say yes. And they might not follow whatever comes out of here. That would be something like leaving the conventions and uh, other things which are more or less impossible. But, but they will follow the liberals and the conservatives. So they agree on it. And as you, you agree, you kind of lost the, the whole... Uh, uh, Just quick question. Yeah. You said the defense and security policy that used to be at 1%? Foreign policy used to, I mean, you have to go all the way back to 88 where there was this election about NATO and having nuclear power, US nuclear power sh ships in Copenhagen and things like that before you really have anything. So in, that's a big jump from one. Yeah, yeah, definitely a big jump, huge jump. Uh, this first up top line here is the number of people deciding doing the election campaign. This is the last election, 19. I don't have the number for this election campaign. Um, but it was 61% here. If we kind of just look at the trend, I mean, we will have a situation where almost two thirds of the population will decide during this campaign. This is the number before with this 47, right? So we've seen how the Danes have increased, how many people changed party. So at the moment it's 47%. This is just the, the, the net volatility. Some people move one way, some other move another way. So this is lower, but it has the same tendency. But it's quite important interesting that this this is the movement between the two blocks that is very stable so even though as i said before five two in the blue f uh, favor at the moment it's 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 seven percent only and the last election it was yeah eight percent moving the point was that this was just four four more or less now it's seven two right and that that kind of gained the blue advantage so you have this so much of the movement as i said before is within parties very little is across. But these, of course, are the ones that decide in the end because the, they will be able to form a government. Um, showing a little bit about uh, electoral geography in Denmark. Um, Denmark being so small, we should think that everybody should vote the same because you can be anywhere in four hours, right? Um, that's not definitely not the case. Denmark is ex extremely divided. Um, you can go 20 minutes out of Copenhagen and you have uh, a very, very different political experience. This is the Social Democrats. Basically what they are gaining at the moment, they have certain strongholds. This was a, used to be a shipyard uh, right here, a big shipyard that used to be a shipyard right here. Maybe I should draw in the shipyards here. But uh, so the really, really strong uh, uh, areas in certain places, but not, let, let looks at, at the cities, they are less red than, it, than the surrounding areas. So the Social Democrats are not the, the, the largest cities and the largest party in the cities if we combine the rest of them. So the cities are definitely red, but they are social liberal, they are socialist people's party, they are alternatives, not so much social democrats. So the cities are basically being lost to, uh, at, by the social democrats. This whole area, the light pink area here, is the liberal country side. I'll show you that map in a moment. That's kind of the this is the conservatives looking how how Søren Pape is living right and I used to live in in Vibro. He is, I still lives there. Um, he used to be a mayor there. Uh, so again, it just show how how strong this uh, notion of of geography geography can play. Again, Northern Zealand very conservative, um, and then a small spots around where there is a strong local candidate, for instance. Um, this is the liberal, so you can see this is where it was light pink uh, before, now it's blue. So the whole Jutland area here is just basically blue. Um, again, the, the liberals have lost the cities. They actually used to be under Anders Fogh Rasmussen. They actually managed to gain a lot of votes in the cities. They have lost that now. Uh, this what we call city liberals, um, have they lost to the liberal alliance. Um, but it also means that where the really big battle is going on is not so much in the cities anymore because the cities are red, so they have already they will they will vote for the red. But the, the really kind of the 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 where the comp competition is really strong is outside the cities, like the area where you had a lot of blue votes and you have oh, and you have this. Oh, no, I think we started all again. Did I push the wrong button? Sure. Um, so, so, so basically, um, mm -hmm. 
So, so the, the point is that, that, that the competition is now not so much in the cities because they are red, but in the countryside, you have the battle between the liberals and the social democrats. So that's where the, the actual election is won. won. It's also there where um, it's, it's also there where you move votes across the middle. You don't, you don't move votes across the middle in the cities. This is the social liberal. You see how strong they are in the cities and almost go no, get no votes outside the cities. So, so these cities are red and they will continue to stay red, but they will just move votes around in the, in the red block. Doesn't really change things. But if you as a social democrat get a vote out here, you actually move a vote across the middle. And that's why it's so important. And that's why this whole notion of rural consciousness, the whole idea that, that these people out here feel left, left behind and f uh, find that the cities are looking down to them. The social democrats are playing that very tough at the moment, trying to say, well, we need to, excuse me, need to do something about it and, and we need to do it quick. It's also here in this area here where Inga Stoiber is getting all her votes. So she, she is, she's not almost getting no votes in Copenhagen, no votes in, in Odense or Aarhus, but she gets all the votes in the rural area. So it's really a, an election where this geography again will play a, a tremendous role. Um, what about Hasnerk in the cities? Could, could he? That, that's a very good point. At the moment, um, the, yeah, at the moment, he is gaining votes from the social liberals, so that should be votes in the cities. Um, so, so that is also votes that are being moved across the middle. And uh, we don't have any... He's, he's, it's still a small party, so it's difficult to me to uh, analyze the geography, because I, I only have 20,000 votes. These are, these are the actual election results. At the moment, I, I'm, I'm playing around with doing maps at the moment, so I have 20,000 interviews and I can plack, plot some of the bigger parties, but he's a little bit too small to make it uh, statistical certain. But he's getting from the social liberal, they get votes in the city, so it seems like he's actually getting into that segment, which is, again, very important, moving votes across the middle. Yeah. But it, but it is a bit, bit we, we only started to draw these maps uh, a few years ago, but it's been really an eye-opener for me that, that it is so different. I mean, just visualizing that, that these are actually the differences in Denmark being like, you can, you can be anywhere here within an hour and a half ride, and it's just a completely different picture when it comes to... Some of this is, of course, something we do with younger people live in cities, more educated people live in cities, but this is far more than education and age. It's, it's, it's more or less like a, almost a life kind of a, um, choice that you choose to live a different life if you live in the countryside compared to, to some of the cities. That's at least what they are saying in the interviews, like this idea of being looked down upon and feeling left over and feeling that their municipalities are not getting the, the money they need, etc. Hospitals are being closed. Stores are being closed, uh, even though um, you can probably be within a huge mall within uh, 20 minutes, they will still feel left behind. But it's uh, definitely a very strong sentiment which is out there. And in 2019, um, it doesn't correlate with any specific party. It will be almost very strong correlation to Inga Stoiber now. So she's been like spot on picking up on this uh, rural sentiment uh, with her discussion about elite in Copenhagen and she had this notion about there's an elite in Copenhagen that just do anything for themselves, etc. So she's very good at kind of building up this anti-elite uh, discussion and, and she do it with, uh, even though of course journalists have tried to kind of poke her because she, well, she was the one who went to the Queen's, ba uh, Queen's uh, ballet you know, and parties and been in the parliament for 20 years, been minister for 20 years, etc. She, 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 like, if someone, someone is the elite, it's her, but she's like still managed to play that game very, very good. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But it, but to me, I mean, I've seen the maps from Sweden, which are also very f fascinating. But in Sweden, the distance are real. <laughs> I mean, the, the distances here are not real. I mean, it's, 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 it, that's, that's what surprised me, that I could still find it in Denmark. Because, I mean, 
you can't be anywhere in Sweden in four hours, right? It takes a little bit longer. So, 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 so those, uh, um, but it's also, so it's, it's, it's not so much a kind of objective feel of being that there's a large distance, it's much more this feeling of being left behind. So, so it's also, when, when the, the governments try and say, well, okay, okay, we've moved some, uh, some governments, uh, uh, institutions to other parts of Zealand or we will move it to Odense or whatever you, you do where, where they have this idea that they can move out different kind of agencies etc. That's kind of, that, it's not going to help because that's going to change this, the, the, their feeling that they're being left behind. It, it's not, it's not in, in any objective sense. I mean these guys out here do have actually quite good jobs and they, uh, the unemployment is higher in Copenhagen compared to for instance most of the other parts of the country, but it's not, it's not so much, it's not a kind of objective, uh, it's much more feeling and a, a notion than it is uh, uh, something that can be quantified when it comes to economy and uh, you know, unemployment. It's, it's true, when you think about having only 19 municipal municipalities in Denmark now, uh, just south of the border, you have several hundred in city Boston. So the distance to the mayor is much bigger than it was before. Is that a part of this feeling to be left alone? That it is very true that we used to have 273, now we have 98. Um, but it, may, it, it, it's, I think it's kind of built to that. That, that now we have there's a longer distance to the mayor. But it's, but it, and, and I think. There's some objective to it also because now the local school is closed, the store is closed. I mean, and you will see that around the country. But again, uh, the hospital might be closed. But again, you can, anywhere in the country, you can be on a university hospital within 45 minutes, right? By car. It's maybe not on the, some of the islands will have an issue of that. But, but otherwise you can't. So the distances are still extremely small. Um, it's, it's also, you can find this, what we call it rural consciousness, like 10 minutes outside, no, now this is not a map of the rural consciousness, but I have other maps that show that. So just outside the cities, 20 minutes out, you can feel that, you can, you can have this sentiment. Um, so it's, it's again, yes, I think objectively speaking, there is longer to the store than it used to be. Um, but the distance are extremely small. Like, okay, maybe you have to travel 10 minutes more by car now before it was maybe 20 minutes now before it was 10. So when we ask the people uh, about these things, about the closing of institution, that of course also matter and, and contribute to this rural consciousness, but it's much stronger, this feeling of being left out there. So it's, it's, it's more of a feeling than it is in an objective sense of being left uh, out. So when, I, when, I, when we try to measure it economically, it's much weaker than if we try to measure it, measure it on the, 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 the feeling, the perspective of feeling left outside. Did I answer your question? Maybe? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no. it's, I mean, if we compare a country, this country with parts of Switzerland, yeah. um, or even Norway, would yeah, yeah. The, the distances are big. And then the democracy, seems to be much more local than it is now in them. But the municipalities here are still strong. I mean, you still pay taxes to the municipality. It's still the municipalities that run the schools. And you meet the municipality, even though the municipalities are larger now, you meet them in your daily life quite often. Um, so so it's, it's the, okay, another way of saying it, it's not just in the... In the municipality that was merged, you see this. You also see it in municipalities that wasn't merged. So even in municipalities which are are quite uh, which stay the same across this, you still see that there will be people having this feeling today than they used, to, which they didn't have. Yeah, I don't think I have more slides than this one. No, this was the last one. Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. Time for QA. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. let's go to the QA and then I think for the sake of our online uh, audience, we'll just pass the microphone around, sure. around in here. So I think, Nikolai, I'll give it to you first and then. 
Thank you. Uh, two questions. Um, first of all, why do you think Mette Frederiksen proposed a government across the aisle? Uh, and, and, and why do you think the opposition was so quick to reject the idea? That was the first question. Yeah. Should, I, should we just... Uh, I'll yeah, let's take them yeah. one at a time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I want us to go back to this one. Where are the parties? I think, so, so Mette Frederiksen was the first, when she called the election, she said, well, I want to have a broad government across the middle. So basically she's saying to all these guys down here, well, I actually would like to work with one of these up here. And these, of course, was, out there. I don't want to be part of that. But they're not going to support these anyway. So she can actually, again, play this game of moving this direction without losing much of their, I mean, they will complain, but basically the voters can complain, but they will just uh, move to the red. So there's very well little for her to lose when she moved this direction. Um, this idea, she, she was saying, I think, so, so first of all, she wouldn't lose much. Secondly, she wanted to build on this statement, uh, being a, a statement in the sense that she was the prime minister, she's this person who is running the country, she had brought Denmark through the corona pandemic, she will bring it through the security crisis, she will bring it through the energy crisis, she is the strong woman to do the job. She was playing on that, being the prime minister. Um, she wanted to have this feeling of rally around the flag, you should support her no matter what. She saw in during the corona time, her now she's about 27%, in the, during the corona time she was like 36% at, at some stake. She has tremendous support. So this whole idea, if she could kind of build that sentiment again, we should support her no matter, not because she is so democrat, but because she is the prime minister and she can, can be a leader taking a country through the crisis. I think that was, and the way she, she done that was, she was looking at the polls, say, okay, I need some of these guys to jump in. First of all, these all said, no, thank you. Except Lars Lueger said, well, maybe if you do this and that and this and... Um, so basically, Lars Lueger wasn't a real yes, but all the others said no. Uh, but she, in that sense, she also kind of took the power out of the argument from the other side. If they had said it first, say, we want to be across the middle. If you ask Danes about, do you want governments across the middle? Yes, no. Most people will say yes like 55% or so will say we, we would like to have a government across the middle. But that, that's, it's not, I don't think it's going to happen. It, it's also kind of quite typical things, I think, because of course you will, you, you're not asking the voters what you really, the best solution will probably be that your party get 50%. But you're not being asked about that, you ask about something else, right? Okay, so if your party is not gaining 50%, are you willing to kind of being pragmatic and, and maybe you can get somehow into power by getting into a broader government? So usually, if you ask Danes about the broader government, they will say yes, um, even though they probably would have preferred something else if that was possible. But quite often, they, you, you ask these questions after the election, what do you want? And then you can look at the polls and say, well, okay, I didn't win, but okay, my second best option is to get into government somehow. So she's playing the strategic game, she's playing the statements game. I think that that's why she, she offered that uh, position. And she was trying to take out the air of the other people not being able to say this. Yeah. Do you think that is reflected also in the election campaign, that she's sort of pushing the strong leader narrative and they, the opposition is focusing more on, on regular welfare issues? And I think she's being forced to focus on some of these regular welfare issues as well. But it's quite obvious if you look at her campaign around the country, she's like, be safe, vote for me. So kind of, again, saying, kind of building on that image of her being the strong leader, which can, which have already got Denmark through one crisis, she can do another. So she's definitely building on that uh, very strongly. But she is being forced to answer questions on, on taxation and and healthcare, etc., of course. But um, it's always, she start, kind of started all her, her presentations out by saying this about being the strong leader, being inclusive and being... And I think she's also really mad with the social liberals down here. She's mad at them because they forced her to call the election, which she wouldn't have had now if she could decide herself. 
so she was saying at the same time she wanted to work with these guys, she also said she didn't want to work with these exclusively. So she's kind of, again, playing hard to get, I think. Um, so otherwise the social liberal would be put in a position that they could have more influence in government than she would have liked. There's been other cases where the social liberals in the negotiations around the government had had quite a lot of say, which uh, she, I think she's trying not to give them now. Thank you, Nikolai. And uh, we've got a couple of more questions here from the room, but we also had a few questions on the chat. Uh, one was just to, f to, uh, to wrap up on uh, Mette Frederiksen and the cross-party yeah. uh, proposal. Online they ask, I don't know if it's within your remit, but w what's the, the likeliness of that actually happening? 2.2%. <laughs> I don't think it's a... It's, yeah, yeah. yeah. But then they elaborate a bit. No, I think I think it's very unlikely that we will see actually her going into power with these guys. At at the moment, it seems if there will be a, a a majority for among the red parties, she will form a red government. She probably will include the the liberals, even though she didn't said she wouldn't. She might include. I think that there was also some kind of openings. He would say. I don't want to build a government exclusively on the social liberals. That means that she could also take the socialist people's party. So those three is definitely an axis that could work and has worked before. Uh, the socialist people's party has been extremely open to this uh, cooperation. They have been, yeah, they've been close to being called uh, like a puppets of the government because they're just kind of supporting whatever metaphor they can say. They'll, they'll say, yes, this is very nice and we will, of course, like to continue. So see, they've been very less critical. I mean, the critic has definitely come from this party. If she should go over here, she, sh she needs some of these other parties. And Lars Lukas has said she will not point on metaphor except if she accepts an a investigation or in this mink discussion. And starting out, pointing to the prime minister, and then having a, a lawyer's investigation in the prime minister seems to be very high, highly unlikely. Why should she accept that at all? Um, this up here is too far left. I'm, I know we talked about it in last election that Danish People's Party and, and the Social Democrats are not that far close, are closer than ever before, and that is definitely true. Uh, it just seemed very, very difficult the way Morten Messerschmitt is playing that, that game at the moment. The Christian Democrats are not getting into Parliament. Um, these two are the big ones, the Liberals and the Conservatives, and they both have rejected the idea that they will support a, a government to the, to the red side. It, it's also, have to, I mean, this whole red and blue, even though Lars Løkke is trying to say, well, it's not existing, that is how Danish politics has worked in 150 years, right? And, and, and the, the way the parties are positioning themselves, are arguing, the, the way the voters kind of notion about left and right and red and blue, that is, I mean, that's the way we see politics. So you will have, there's a, there's a blue identity and a red identity. And if that kind of breaks apart, it happens once before in 1978, where the Social Democrats and the, the Liberals have formed the government. It lasted for eight months. Um, I think the experience at that time was it was a mess. It was very very difficult. Uh, um, I think she she will be much more inclined to do this, or you will see Lars Lüge in a government with the Liberals and, and the Conservative if there is a blue majority. At the moment, this is probably uh, well both cases. So I guess there's two scenarios. There will be. Mette Frederiksen, Social Liberals, and the Socialist People's Party, one government, if that's a red majority, if there's blue majority, it would be Lars Lüge, um, and it would be uh, uh, the Liberals and the Conservative, with, with supporting parties from, from the others here. Um, Lars Lüge is not so keen to have the Danish Democrats, but the Danish Democrats will not go to the other side, so I mean, there's not really a, a situation where they can come up with any kind of demands, they will say continue the strict immigration politics that would be enough to keep these guys uh, to support them. Um, so I think there's two scenarios with a three-party government on either side. That, that's at least 
But again, whether which way is going to go, it's going to go is really difficult because the poles are so close at the moment. Thank you, Kasper. And again, we'll go to the room. There was another question. I think earlier in your presentation, you talked about foreign policy and maybe how it featured in the campaign. Again, from our audience online, there was a question about the party's policy towards China. Obviously, a big global question. Does that feature at all? Is that of any significance? What can you say about it? Um, so foreign policies is not a discussion in the campaign at all. So when it's when it says security and, and foreign policy in that slide before, that is basic Ukraine discussion. That is about that. That's the discussion, not so much the Danish relations to other countries. It, it's, it's, yeah, it's it's very well seldom because the Danish parties agree so much on these things that 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 you don't see. It's not a good campaign uh, discussion, and. So also in compared discussion with China, it's it's not something that are being discussed at all. Not not even I mean the, the, this, I mean I guess it could come up with the Denmark going to the World Cup uh, in, in, in soccer, right? That that could be a discussion where it was kind of relevant. But even in that case, it's not being discussed because that kind of obvious that is something that has to be decided, uh, but it's not being discussed in the, among the party leaders. Then we've got. At least four questions here. Five now. We'll go to the local first, Michael. I was just wondering if you could um, say anything about uh, whether there are any election outcomes that could uh, affect a change in uh, work permit rules, because I know there's a labour shortage and business organisations are calling for that. And a similar question um, with regard to citizenship rules, because the number of adults that live in Denmark that vote in elections is going down because citizenship rules are strict. Is there any possible outcome that could that could affect that also? So it's two parts. I think I think the quick question is, is, is answer is simply no, because both of this is somehow related to this consensus of a strict immigration policy. Even though I think we both can agree on that if we kind of start to talk about citizenship, it's actually something else. But but this is being put into the same pot when politicians are discussion. So at the moment, Denmark is probably the the strictest place to get citizenship um, in the world, more or less, uh, and it doesn't seem to be changing. I know that some parties down in this area, down here, might want to open up for that, but the Social Democrat will definitely not. If they open it up, it will be attacked by all these guys. So the, the Social Liberal will also, of course, like to open it up, but the, the blue parties want, want easier uh, transfer of skilled labor, for example, with work permits. It's, it, it's another issue that Denmark is really bad at kind of accepting foreign education, kind of translate into Danish education system. Uh, but, but also, even though you have like refugees from Syria now being well integrated, there's been a couple of discussions about that late, lately in the, in the news that very well integrated, speak the language, work, etc. They still have to kind of leave when it's it being... And, and the Social Democrats was very quickly out saying, we have to stick with our uh, strict policies, we're not changing anything. So even though the Liberal Alliance, and you can also hear it sometimes at the Conservatives, that we are needing labor, um, I don't think they, they dare to touch it because of this, uh, the connection with the immigrant discussion, which historically has played this huge role in politics. Um, Somehow they have to lift this discussion out of the immigration and kind of put it to an, another kind of a green card discussion. But but at the moment it definitely is so much linked to the immigration discussion and, and refugees discussion that is, it seems unlikely that is really going to change. Somehow do you need to lift it out to say, well, this is not a discussion about immigrants and refugees. It's about labor shortages and having qualified labors and, and all the companies, private companies, are, and also in the public sector are screaming for, for employment, employment at the moment. I think, yeah, but, but the point being, you have to kind of, they have to manage to, to disconnect it and it, it doesn't seem to happen at the moment. And it's definitely not happening in the campaign because that will be, yeah, they could blow up in their faces. Thank you, Kasper. Then I think we'll go to Osama. Thank you. Uh, having 
I mean, looking at the tendencies in the elections and having so many parties, 14 parties, a major part of the parties are on the right wing. Or Do you see any tendencies that Denmark is turning to the right like other EU countries? Um, in terms of, of, of immigration policies, Denmark has definitely turned to more strict policies on refugees over the years. Just measuring the party's placement, you, will, you see they're moving. So they have moved and I don't, I'm, I don't, maybe not going to see an extra move in this election, but I think the biggest move was actually in the period before, where especially you saw the Social Democrat moved further to the right in 2019, from 15 to 19, compared to in the 30 years before. So Danish politics has definitely moved to the right in the sense of right being on the immigration discussion. Not so, uh, when it comes to uh, the other dimension here, uh, they are more stable. They haven't changed much. In terms of the support to the welfare state, taxation, I, I, I don't see them moving to the right. They're moving to the right on immigration and values, um, but not on economy. So that's very interesting in London. No, no. I don't see the Italian model, no. Because, because both the Danish People's Party uh, and Danish Democrats are, are center when it comes to economy. You only have this new party, which are Italian, so to speak, in that sense, being economic liberal uh, and anti-immigrant. Where, yeah, you also have economic liberal here, but they're not that much uh, anti-immigrant. Thank you. Please. Yes, um, you mentioned earlier that there's a possible fourth uh, prime minister candidate being Lars Lurke. What would have to happen that he would actually become a prime minister? So, so Lars Lurke is former prime minister. He is extremely experienced in terms of negotiating things. He knows the parliament. He knows people. He know. So he's at the moment. So he's like saying that. He, he, he don't want to be placed in the blue block. I placed him there because I think it's safe to place him there. But he doesn't, he wants to be purple. So he wants to play the game. So he's saying, well, I could go either way, he's saying. And he's, because he's so experienced, other parties have tried to play that game before and, and the journalists simply wouldn't let them. They, I mean, there's like really good footage of like candidates saying, well, I don't want to claim who should be prime minister before or after the election. I want to see who can give me more influence. And other party leaders have tried to, the, these have, the Social Liberal have tried it, uh, the, the Liberal Alliance tried it at one point, and were simply forced to choose side. Like the journalist was like forcing them to say, okay, you have to tell the voters who you're going to support, otherwise it's not trustworthy. You have to, you have to, you have to. And then they ended up deciding. Look at being so experienced, it's just like saying, well, you can ask the question as many times as you want, I will go either way. And he's like, he, he's, he, he, he's doing it with, with some experience and, and, yeah, and power, so it, it, it doesn't seem to like he will fall into that trap. Okay, so, so he's trying to say, he's telling Mette Frederiksen that he will not point at her, except if she's accepting this investigation. She will not do that. Um, these two here are, are definitely more open for his cooperation. They, they will be, and if he's, at the moment, he, they need his vote in order to form a majority. So at the moment, they, if, you, if you leave these out and he's not being uh, kind of considered into that blue government, he, he, he's playing the game so tough that he might want to go to the other side somehow. He definitely will play the game. And I'm not sure that these two guys will dare it because if they end up pushing him to the other side but not giving him so, anything, so I think the best idea, if, if he should be prime minister, is actually is at the moment the liberals here are about fourteen percent. These are about eight percent. He's about six percent. He he should end up being maybe a little larger, maybe like eight percent, almost same size as the conservative. Then he has to be taken even more serious. So gaining a little bit more in the polls, um, being in a situation where he can play the two guys out against each other, then uh, he could end up being a prime minister. But the joker here is also very much Inger Stoiberg. Inger Stoiberg and Lars Lüge are not good friends. So Inger Stoiberg could be like saying that, okay, I will only point to Pepe, for instance, which has, she has said because she also don't like 
element being from her former party. So there's a lot of kind of nitty gritty likes and dislikes here. So, um, but but Lucas is also, I think, if he gets something, give, give him a minister, give him something important. Uh, maybe he can be foreign minister or something, and then he would be probably be happy with that. Um, so so it's, it's also very much about giving him something, I think. Um, and I, I think it's very difficult not to see him in government, actually, if there is a blue majority, because he he is. Uh, I think he is for sale when it comes to give him a, uh, some. He doesn't have to be prime minister, but. Uh, uh, yeah, minister of something big will be uh, satisfactory, satisfying for him, I think. Yeah. Thanks, Kasper. And we'll just uh, call out to our audience online uh, in the chat. Please raise your hand if you've got questions. Uh, it's almost coming up to 12 o'clock. So I think we are going to go for the last couple of questions. I think we had Jürgen first and then Stefan afterwards. Kasper, how likely is it that we will see a minority government again? The art of uh, compromising in Denmark is, is uh, famous. So what about... I, I think it's, it, we will see a mi minority government. So, so that's almost for, sh for sure. I think it's, we'll see a majority government will be, I think, a, a huge government with all parties doesn't make sense. Um, it's, it's much more effective in Denmark to be a small government where you can kind of move around going to either side. If you had to kind of have a government, let's say, with the moderates and the conservative liberals and the Danish Democrats here, somehow they, they have to agree on a, a statement what that government should work on. And just being able to agree on that sheet of paper will be very, very difficult. So it's much easier for them just to say, okay, we have a minority government and then we will work with these guys when it comes to immigration and we will, when it comes to the EU, we will probably go more this way and include the social democrats when there's something on welfare and, and so forth. So, so I think being playing back and forth with these uh, moving coalitions, it's much more likely than, than seeing a majority government. Uh, it's been a while since we've seen that. So it's, and of course, we can play around with the numbers at the moment in the polls, but it's actually quite difficult to see how that majority government should look like. Like the idea that the social democrats should go with these guys and then have a majority government is like, ah, it's not going to happen. Yeah, that's a very good point. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so even though we have small governments, you will see that because you want to have some security that, that a change in government is not going to change everything, you have passed yeah, there will be a, a very, very broad coalition behind almost any major law in Denmark, yeah. Yes, yes. Given your explanations here and including this, that the voters only have a broad government as a second best choice in reality, are you su should we be surprised of the opinion polls for Lars Lerke? Um Are you? Uh, I th I yeah, I think actually it's, it has more to do with that he is uh, he's doing very good on TV. He's doing a really good job when he's arguing. He's trying to be uh, uh, the adult in the room, as he uh, somehow calls himself. So he, he's really trying to play that. And, he, and because he's not... It's quite effective. I mean, he, can, he is the party. So whatever he's saying, that is the policy, right? Whereas the, the liberals will say, okay, am I for or against the heart, head, head scarves? Um, then, then you have to go ask your party, what, what do we mean about this? That's where you can just decide. So he's, he is, he's much, much quick to kind of come up with these answers. There's been several cases in the last week where the conservative and liberals are somehow becoming insecure what they actually mean. Um, so Lars Lukey can play that, he, and he's also playing the game that the, he's winning that the liberal, social liberals are doing so badly. So at the moment they're saying, okay, we just forced the prime minister to resign uh, and call an election, but after the election we will point to her as new prime minister anyway. And, it's, and why, why is that? It's like it's, it's somehow it's, a, it's a quite a difficult communication the social liberals have forced themselves into, and they are just... Yeah, they're not doing very well in the polls either. So they lost almost, they've been cutting half at the moment. 
whereas Lars Løkke has doubled in the campaign. 10,000 votes moved, moved from the social liberal to Lars Løkke uh, in the first week of the campaign. Yeah, thank you, Kasper. I think we'll just go for one last question from uh, Japanese media. Yoko, please. Uh, I have a, a more like a general tendency of uh, Danish uh, politics and, and election. So uh, this uh, high turnout and also a relatively high, um, you know, trust and satisfaction to the politics. Will, will, does it affect to this landscape of uh, politics uh, for this uh, specific election? Um, yeah, qu quite often you, you should think that the voters should be really confused when they see a picture like this. I think what, what, what somehow the, the Danish voters are, I can sometimes explain like the like a spider web there that you may be placed here, but you somehow you know your distance to the various parties. So so voters actually are quite. They, I think I, if I took this map and I ask the voters to place the party left to right, I think almost 50% of the Danish voter could draw this map. So, 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 so somehow Danes are quite good at navigating this quite confusing system, I must say. Um, and, and that helps a lot in terms of understanding why movements are here, here, and not across. And it also means that they are being the campaigns are very good at mobilizing their core voters, so they will go out and say, well, you are a social democrat because of this and this and this. Um, and when you come to the turnout, um, one of the things which are quite important in Denmark is that um, most of the votes are by uh, at the polls. It's like you, you don't, you don't, very few vote absentee, it's like 8% in the last election. So usually it's just elderly people who vote by mail. All of the rest of us actually go to the poll. Usually you, you bring your partner and your kids and everything. It's, it's like an event. Um, so you, it's a, there's a lot of uh, customs and rituals around the election day, which kind of people either vote in the morning or afternoon. And that kind of keep us, um, that kind of commitment the social commitment of doing that. So you will probably, so, so I will vote with my wife, right? And I will probably bring the kid uh, and, and, and so forth. So you, you, you go together. Two thirds of all Danes actually vote with somebody else in their household, like a physical going down there. Uh, and I think that that kind of social fabric. Um, so if, I, if, 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 if you live with somebody else who can vote and I will be sitting at home and say, well, I don't want to vote this time. She would look at me like, why, why? And you have to kind of explain. Um, so we see that the turnout is higher in families compared to single households, for instance, because there's no one to remind you you should go and you have no, no one to vote with. Um, turnout drops if you get divorced. Turnout increase if you get married. And it's like all these things kind of helps. Uh, and and the, most, the most important thing when it comes to vote is where your mom votes. Yeah. So among, it's, it's an ex extremely strong, you can, you can find an effect of mom voting until you're 70 years old. That means that your mom must be like in the 90s, right? So, so th this effect is of course stronger among uh, youngest, but it's actually, so it's, it's very much, the point is that it seems like that, that voting is something we inherit from our parents, uh, and that that effect is extremely strong. Um, it's a uh, yeah, it's it's by far the strongest effect of education. Of course, more educated vote more than less educated people in work more in non work or so forth. But by far, mom, that's the thing. So if you get the mom to vote, uh, it's 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 very very likely that you will vote as well. <laughs> Thank you, Casper. I think uh, that wraps it up nicely. Uh, I haven't heard that before, but uh, I can tell you for sure my mom, she is, she's voting. I'm not going to tell you what she's going to vote. And I'm also going to vote too. So, well, there you are. Yep. But Kasper, thanks a lot. That was really interesting. We are very glad to have you yeah. here in the IPC again. And um, thanks also for all the good questions from the room. I'm sure there's plenty more.
but uh, we'll work that out. And again, thanks for you guys joining us online. Uh, we'll keep you posted on more events before the election. So thanks for today and uh, have a nice weekend. Stop the